Hey, hey, how's it going, everybody? Um, all right, so I haven't used StreamYard to broadcast live into Messy Middle yet. Um, so hopefully this goes according to plan. Also, um, this client experience screen is supposed to be, uh, when you share screens on StreamYard, you're supposed to have two screens. So it's a little tricky um, to do it like this, but we're gonna plug through and do it. Um, I won't do a long intro, you guys should know who I am by now. Um, former team leader and productivity coach. I run a group of about 125, 130 agents right now. And um, I just spoke and taught this class last week for Lindsay Dodge, a amazing member of our group and panelist um, at our last event uh, to teach her group um, a little bit about the ultimate client experience, which is their 2021 initiative. And I think this could be everybody's initiative is to um, up level their client experience. So, um, <laughs> Eli Torres, what's up, man? Uh, I've got my comments open on my phone, so I'll try and get to those if you guys have specific questions as well. I'm trying a bit of a new format here. Um, all right, let's get started. So, service versus experience. So, um, think in your head, you know, what are some examples of a service? that you pay for, right? So the example that gets thrown out or the one that comes to my mind is um, getting your oil changed. Like you go to get your oil changed and you pull in and they change your oil, you pay 40 bucks or whatever it is and you drive out, right? That's not much of an experience. However, there definitely are places that can up level that, right? And can turn that into more of an experience. So let's say you had an appointment, let's say you pulled in, they offered you a cold water or a, a hot coffee or something while you waited. You didn't actually have to get out of your car. Um, there's all these things they could do to turn that into more of an experience rather than just a service, or it could just be a quick in and out service. Um, experiences, right? Those are going to be more like luxury cruises. Um, sometimes when you go into a really high-end car dealership, that'll be an experience. A really um, nice meal at a fancy restaurant, right? That's not going to be like your grab and go, sit down and, and get a bowl of uh, a takeout, but more of a, a dining experience, right? It's all about the ambiance. It's all about, you know, what they bring you. I, I once had this really, really fancy dinner um, for my wife's birthday and um, we did, they had like three different kinds of butter. They had like a specific butter that went with three different kinds of bread. So there were three butters and three breads. And this is before we even got started on drinks or anything else, right? And um, definitely, you know, some people shared about their experiences at higher end um, establishments. And those were, um, very similar, like when they stood up or when they left the table, somebody would come by and like refold their napkin or would, you know, wipe down and, and reset the entire table so that when they came back from the, the bathroom, it felt um, as if they were just sitting down for the first time again, right? So um, right here, I have luxury lifestyle homework. Um, what I would encourage everybody to do, if you want to create an incredible customer experience, you need to go do some homework and uh, understand and experience what people are getting. And so this is not your excuse to go book three weeks at the Four Seasons and tell your wife that that was my uh, decision or that that was my suggestion. But you should go to a really nice resort. You should go to a really high-end car dealership. You should go to some places that have an incredible customer experience and you should go experience it. You should go find out and take notes and don't just like go and order a drink and eat some food and like just kind of blow by, right? Go there with the intention of making it a business exercise. Go there with the intention of really taking notes on the things that really stood out to you. And I would challenge you to do some things um, additionally while you're there to, to maybe think of ways they could have improved it. Um, if you don't find that you had an experience that was uh, equal or greater than the amount that you paid for that experience, what were some things they missed, right? Where were, the, where were some areas where they could have done better? Um, and maybe, you know, maybe even tell uh, the manager that or if your waiter or whoever it was, if your salesperson, what, you know, whenever you run into really exceptional service, um, make it a point to go to that person's supervisor or whatever it is, or go on Yelp and really leave them that compliment, right? Tell them that what they're doing really made the difference or show them that um, in their tip that you leave. 
um, because you know you would want somebody to do the same for you, and those are um, those are really important actions to be able to carry that forward and and really make somebody you know know that they did a great job, so that they'll do more of it. Right? We all want that positive feedback. Um, it was John's idea. Megan says, "Thank you, thank you, Megan. I appreciate you throwing me under the bus as usual." Um, reactive versus proactive. So one of the biggest things about creating a customer experience is going to be being proactive rather than being reactive. A lot of agents might describe their, um, they might describe their job as a firefighter, right? Oh, I put out fires. Or some people are really proud of the fact that they're able to handle problems or solve problems. And I would argue that, yes, you want to solve as high level of problems as you can. Solving problems is really your job, not just in real estate, but in life. Um, however, I would argue that your ability to foresee problems before they become a problem, and this comes back, we'll talk a lot about framing today. Um, this goes back to framing quite a bit as far as understanding the problems that could occur and having things in place to make sure that they either don't occur or that they occur with less impact than what they might have um, occurred with is going to be really, really important. Um, if you guys have any questions at all, feel free to pop them in the chat. I am uh, monitoring that as well. I think I've got this figured out. So um, any questions on that, just let me know. I am going to move forward on to kind of how we frame this out. So if you guys have read the book Raving Fans, there is a 5S model. So the 5S model is set, serve, survey, surpass, and sustain. Um, so as far as set, right, we want to set expectations. Um, we want to tell people up front what they can expect to experience. We want them to have a mutual expectation. So um, the question I put here is, what is good communication? So think about that for a second and, um, and answer in your head or pop it in the chat box. You know, what do you think is good communication? How is that defined? And the answer I usually get on this one is good communication is, oh, if I get back to people right away, or good communication is, you know, constantly updating them or whatever, a lot of different things. Um, what I see good communication as is uh, communicating in the manner and the frequency at which somebody is looking for. So you're going to have certain clients that only want to hear from you when it's a real problem or when it's really good news. They only want the most important stuff. And then you're going to have other clients that want to be communicated with um, only by text. And some clients only want to see, receive a weekly email update, right? If you don't understand their preferred method of communication, whether they want a text or a phone call or an email, and that's not to say that that's the only way you communicate with them, but that is their preferred. So if everything is normal, if everything is going according to plan, can you update them by text every step of the way? Like, Think of a service, right, that you might experience. Like I know there are certain things like restaurants or um, some tours or different things, right, experiences where literally uh, throughout the process, they're going to update you by text. Hey, your table is ready. Or thanks for dining with us. Here's a survey or whatever that is, right? So those things might continue to be updated or communicated like, hey, your room is ready. Like, I don't know if anybody's checked into a hotel lately, but a lot of times right now, you can check into the hotel, make your reservation, ask for new towels. You can do everything by text. Um, when I was at, I went to this like glamping thing a couple weeks ago and they offered a text feature. They checked in on us after we had, uh, had checked into the little cabin. They, um, they, when we had a problem, we could text them and let them know about it. I wanted to stay in the same room. I didn't want to switch cabins. They were able to accommodate that all by text. So the fact that they were able to text me and do all that while I was out and about doing, you know, hiking and doing my stuff was way better than having to walk over the 25 feet to the office and stand in front of somebody or pick up the phone and have the conversation with them. That is stupid, right? Like it should have been easier to just walk over and talk to somebody. It should have been easier to just pick up the phone and talk to somebody. But I don't want me personally, I don't want to talk to anybody ever if I can avoid it. Um, I would much prefer to communicate only by text. And so if they, you know, they gave that option and so they got that experience. Um, serve. So when you serve people, this whole process, this whole philosophy, it's very, very important that you are the expert. If you have incredible systems, if you have an amazing experience, if you offer chocolates and gifts and all this other stuff, 
but you're not the expert, if you're not the best at what you do, then the rest of it is really irrelevant. And so if you're not a great negotiator, if you don't understand the market, if you're not a phenomenal real estate agent, and most importantly, if you don't care, if this is just a, a way for you to build your business and you don't genuinely care about the people you're working with or the experience that they have, then, then you might as well just scrap the entire thing. It's not going to work. Um, systems allow you to serve the clients at the highest, at the highest level. So uh, one example is there are some teams that will bring the client into the office and they'll play a video or they will send videos ahead of time um, to be able to make sure that that moment, whatever that moment in the transaction is, that that moment is delivered at a 10 every single time. Because there are these very critical moments throughout the transaction that if you miss that, right, if you don't explain that, then you could go from a 10 to a zero really fast. So one of them would be um, wire fraud. So we are super adamant about how we explain wire fraud to our clients and we make sure we cover it every single time. And if your client were to not get that message or not hear it in the right way and they don't call the escrow company to verify the wire and then they send their money to some offshore account in the Caribbean and it gets lost and they lose $40,000. Do you think there's any chance of you recovering that to a, to a five or a six or a seven? No, they're going to have a zero experience and you're, you're not only going to hear about it, but thousands of people are going to hear about it. Um, the same thing goes if you forgot to tell your clients not to buy a bunch of furniture on credit uh, the week before closing. So there's all these things that you can do to systemize the client experience. And you can do those in transactional ways for milestones that are really important that they hear those messages. But you can also do them in ways that are super fun and super engaging and, and surprise and delight and things like that. So we'll get there. Um, the next one is survey. So you want to be surveying people at multiple times throughout the transaction and you want to ask great questions to understand them better. So um, for instance, uh, what we do is when we first bring a client in, we give them a VIP form. And so the VIP form helps us understand their preferences. So do they prefer text or email? Do they prefer, um, do, what are their kids' birthdays? Do they like caramels or brownies? And the caramels or brownies one, or like their favorite charity, those things seem uh, a little odd to them sometimes, um, but they're not. What they do is um, they allow us to give gifts that are really purposeful regarding what they really uh, will value. So for instance, one time um, I had sent a referral or done something nice and somebody sent me this really great gift gift thing, right? Gift bag or whatever. And in it were these amazing white chocolate macadamia nuts, right? White chocolate covered macadamia nuts. They were, I'm sure they were expensive. They were really nice. Well, um, I don't like white chocolate and I don't like macadamia nuts. So somebody ate them. Somebody enjoyed them in my office, right? My staff or my, my colleagues or whatever, but it wasn't me. And so while it was an incredibly thoughtful gift and I still talk about it to this day, I do still use it as an example of a gift gone wrong because it was not something that was personal to what I would actually enjoy. And so if you survey your customers and you understand them more, you're able to give them things at a higher level. For instance, um, if you find out that you know uh, people like what their hobbies are. So let's say I know a certain specific segment of my database, all these people have told me over time that they really like golf. Well, guess what? When I'm communicating with my database over time, I'm gonna be able to take that information about knowing they like golf, and I'm going to be able to tailor our interactions more specifically towards golf. So if I see a really interesting article about golf, or I know there's a golf event coming up, or if there's some new clubs or a new you know, gear or whatever it is coming out, I can use that messaging to create a deeper relationship with that person based on that. So those are some fun ways that you can use it. Um, additionally, it's the really basic ways, right? So how did you hear about us? Um, you know, asking questions about what they expect along the way, right? One of the things we're taught when we, when we teach classes is to ask, um, you know, what are people looking for? What, uh, what do you hope to get out of the class today? So if you asked your customers what they hope to get out of their experience, like what would make this a 10 for you? Then you're going to have a better understanding. And then additionally, you can always ask them questions um, about how it's going. 
So, you know, how have things been so far? How is your, how is your first week working with us experience? How's your MLS search going on a scale of one to 10? Do you feel like we've really narrowed it down? Have we honed in on the proper search criteria or are we messing that up? Now, do you think it's better if you have some formal system or some way that you can ask questions like that to make sure you're on track? Or do you think it's better if you just continue to wait until they say, oh, hey, can we refine the criteria? Right. One looks like it's on purpose. One looks like you're doing it because you know that it needs to be tweaked and updated. One of it just looks reactionary, like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to wait around for you to tell me that you don't like the, the properties that are coming through your email. Um, Surpass. Or, well, I'll stay on surveys for one more thing. So then you want to survey them at the end of the transaction as well. So it's really important to survey prior to asking for reviews because there is the opportunity for you to correct a bad experience. So sometimes, you know, you thought you gave a 10 and you really only gave a seven or an eight. And there's this one thing, this one little thing that if you had just addressed it, if you had just said you're sorry or, or done something to change it or rectify it, um, you would have a better score, right? You would have a 10. And so before you go asking for a review, it's a really good idea to make sure that the people you're asking for reviews from are giving you a five-star review. And you can frame that uh, by talking to people ahead of time and, and letting them know that you're going to be uh, asking for a review and that your intention is to have a five-star review and that you want to do everything you can. And if at any time they're not experiencing five-star service or however you want to define it, that they stop, right? That they pause and they let you know to give you an opportunity to jump in and rectify that. And then um, surpass. So you want to surprise and delight. So very important that you give yourself room to raise the bar. So create a base level experience and a base level expectation, and then find strategic moments within the transaction or within the relationship that you can plus it. And there's all kinds of ways where you can add just a little bit of a touch, right? I'll, I'll remember the first time I came back on a cruise ship and the towel was folded into a little like flamingo or whatever the heck it was, the towel animal on the bed, right? I'd never seen that before. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. Or when I showed up um, somewhere for my anniversary and they had like a little cake and, and a thing in my room, like an amenity that I wasn't expecting, right? And it said happy anniversary and some chocolate strawberries and all that stuff. So there's all kinds of little moments Moments. And what you want to do is you want to find the most, um, the, the ways that work for you. So you want it to be genuine. You want it to be something that um, is going to have high impact and you want it to um, have high impact and also be cost effective. So um, if it's going to be repeatable and it's going to be systemizable, then you want it to be cost effective based on your budget and you want it to have certain triggers so that it can just occur every single time. So like one guy I know, um, John Gletch, Gletch Group, Arizona, um, when they receive a new client, they send a uh, like a welcome box. So you can look up Gletch Group on Instagram, but this welcome box is rad. So it's custom branded. It's got the same stuff in it every time. It's got all local treats. So it's got cool things from the area that they sell in, in Arizona. And they put a little handwritten card in it and they ship it off and the person gets it two or three days later. Now what happens is sometimes people are relocating to their area very frequently and they don't um, come to that area for another three weeks or three months after they were first introduced, but it gives them a real really, really warm welcome to get to know the team and get to know the area and have some, um, some tastes and smells and feels um, about what that's going to be like ahead of time. So those types of systems are really, really cool. And that sets the tone for the entire relationship. And then, you know, it's just blast off from there. And if you see what he does, um, dude, he's, he's incredible. So I would highly recommend you checking out um, John Gletch and his whole thing. I'm playing with the slides now. Um, and then sustain. So uh, if you guys were all live here with me and we've got a handful of viewers and I know a lot of people watch this later, um, what I would ask you to do is um, raise your hand, right? If you have a client that you sold a house to that, has, uh, that you haven't spoke with in a week, right? We've all, we all got clients that we haven't spoke to in a week that we sold a house to. Now keep your hand raised if that's a month and then keep your hand raised if that's two months, three months, a year, two years, five years, right? We all have these clients that we sold a house to that we haven't talked to in like two years or three years or five years. So what's that like, right? The average client that you, that you work with, you're talking to almost daily, 
right? For a month to two months, whatever that is. Sometimes it's a year, right? I have a client that I've worked with right now for a year. So what's it like when you close that deal and you give them the keys and that bottle of champagne and the cutting board and whatever it is you do, and then that's it. That's the end of the relationship. You guys don't talk anymore. You don't follow up, right? Then immediately what they're going to think is that you were just in it for the check. And as soon as you got your check, the relationship was over. Now, a lot of people will tell me at this stage, like, John, I don't know, like, the I don't, I don't know about this client. Like I have some clients that are weird or I have clients that I don't want to hang out with, or maybe they're very professional and they would see that as like an invasion of privacy. If we continue to try and have a relationship with them and like, that's fine. And if you're getting your leads randomly from um, the internet, number one, but depending on your lead source, you're going to find that you might not have shared values and um, shared interests with your clients. And it's gonna make the staying in touch portion much more difficult if it's not systemized. And so for those people, right, you want a catch-all system that's gonna allow you to continue to follow up and have a relationship with people that you sold houses to so they don't feel like it was just about a check. And at the same time, in a perfect world, you would really like all of your clients. You'd want to spend a lot of time with them. You'd want to get a run to referrals from them so that you can meet more people that are just like them. And so those types of businesses, when you build your business that way, it's going to be a lot easier for you to do this. Um, one thing that I think is really important is to find out the lifetime value of a customer. So take your average commission and then multiply it by let's say seven transactions over the course of the life that you're going to have that person and then multiply that again by let's say seven because ultimately that person can refer you a client every single year right and you want to narrow these things down to just one and we'll talk about that more in just a little bit um but your your value of one customer is astronomical you know it's a hundred thousand dollars minimum i don't care what market you work in um and it's probably closer to a million dollars or more so if you really understood the value of one customer, you would be doing a ton of stuff after you sell that house to continue to engage them, continue to get referrals off of them, continue to make sure that every five to seven years or whenever it is that they end up selling or moving or buying an investment property or whatever they do is done through you because you guys have a genuine relationship that you're carrying forward. Um, feel free to pop your questions in the chat, by the way if you guys have any questions. Um, set and serve. So we talked about the VIP form, right? Do they want cookies or brownies? Do they want a text or call? We ask what's their favorite charity. We like to give back to things that are important to them. So I'm wearing my Generosity Global hoodie. We also um, let them know ahead of time that we are mission driven. And so we, uh, we donate out of every closing and from our revenue share to Generosity Global to build wells in Africa and help the homeless here in America and build shower trucks and do all kinds of stuff. And so um, it's important that they know that upfront because they need to understand um, that their transaction has a bigger impact on the world. And so that's why I wear the hoodie a lot. That's why if you guys um, would like to get involved in being you know, mission-driven business, let me know. Um, there's pathways with Generosity Global and I can show you how to set up your own um, if you have the time to do it and the energy to do it. But I just decided that um, be partnering with a charity and a, and a system, right? Plugging into a program that already existed was gonna be a lot better for me. So we actually have little cards that are made um, that say that the Pew Group supports Generosity Global. We show them where their impact is you can break it down dollar for dollar you can show how many showers were given to the homeless or how many people receive clean water for the rest of their life by um based on that experience and so when you get people plugged into that up front and you set those expectations and you show them that that there really is a bigger picture um you can have some really incredible results out of that and it feels a lot more authentic and it's a lot easier to get up and go to work in the morning when you're doing that. Um, having a consultation checklist, like I'm not a big proponent of having a bunch of printed materials. I think that any, too many printed materials that you just stick down in front of somebody during a presentation, like a buyer consult or a listing presentation, um, I feel like those have to live on their own. They have to, they have to live up to whatever standard they're printed on. And so if you don't have this amazing presentation or the presentation doesn't match the individual that you're talking to, then they're not going to get what you could have gotten if you just built a really great relationship. And so um, 
I don't like to work off of uh, a lot of printed materials because I think that diminishes the connection that we can have when I'm sitting in front of somebody. And at the same time, I do like to work off of a checklist. So what are the things that we need to cover, right? Are we gonna make sure that we go over all of the specific things that are gonna be most important to set those expectations up front? And if you do, then you can layer in a bunch of framing. And I'll get to framing in just one second. Um, the Al said story. So one of my lenders, Al said, um, he has an incredible customer experience. So when, when he starts working with a client, he actually asks them um, non COVID times, but I think probably COVID anyway, um, just safely, he asks them to come into the office. So they come into the office and while they're waiting, they're presented with a menu and on the menu, right? You get this little menu and on the menu are all kinds of snacks, drinks, champagne, um, everything you could want, coffee, tea, whatever it is, Snickers bar, like whatever, that's all presented on a menu for you to order from while you're waiting to meet with him. And then after about five minutes, you get brought back. And then at the end of the meeting, he gives you a gift. And the gift is a gratitude journal. And inside the cover of the gratitude journal, he's um, got this thing that explains the power of gratitude and how that's impacted his life and what the gratitude journal is all about and why he's giving it to you and so on and so forth. And so it creates this really incredible customer experience. Um, and, and I just love the way Al sets the tone with that. Um, Dr. Chavez is my dentist. So my dentist is an experience. It is not a service. So when you go in, you're offered um, coffee or tea. Like, I don't know any dentist in the world that offers you coffee before you get your teeth cleaned. But like, why couldn't you? I'm sure most people don't take her up on it. But the fact that you just ask is really powerful, right? Um, and then everybody on staff already knows everything about you because they're very loyal to their database. So when you walk in, they're like, hey, John, how's it going? How's Bennett? How's Campbell? Like, I know that these people don't know my kids' names by heart. I know that she is diligent about having every single person on her team review the database prior to the appointment so that they can have a personal experience with everybody who comes through. And then additionally, they walk you back. And when you first are a client, they give you a tour of the office and they show you how they sanitize their materials. And then they offer you a heated neck pillow or a cooled neck pillow. They offer to turn on the chair massager. They'll put on whatever music or movie you want. They, uh, they use like a special lip balm on your lips to make sure your lips don't crack. Like literally they have done every single possible thing you can think of to make this an experience at the dentist rather than just a service. And because of that, I talk about my dentist all the time and I've referred her like 20 clients. If you create a memorable experience, people will talk about it. This is the whole point of raving fans, right? Raving fans want to share an experience that they had that was really incredible. Um, the importance of framing. So framing is a really important um, topic. It's a really important strategy that you can use in your business to uh, set expectations, but also to exceed expectations. So if I say that um, we are Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, that you know, part of the process is you're going to get a home inspection. We're going to refer you three companies. You're going to choose one. They're going to come out. They're going to inspect the property. They're going to find a 500 page report of every single thing that's wrong with the property. We're going to ask for 100 of those items. We are going to get denied on 99 of them. They're going to say yes to one. It's probably going to be the one we care the least about. And that's just the way it's going to go because it's a really heavy seller's market right now. So I just want you to know that it's not unusual to receive a 500 page report, ask for a hundred things, and then only get one resolved. And then when we actually have the home inspection, Hey, guess what? Mr. And Mrs. Buyer, great news. It looks like the report's only 150 pages of those. I think there's about 10 items that are really important, not a hundred. So we're going to go ahead and ask for these 10 and guess what? Great news. We got seven out of the 10 on our list. How cool is that? And then this becomes a moment by which you can ask for a referral. So you set the expectation that it was going to be worse than it is. The reality lived up to be better than expected. You framed it by telling them, hey, how great is that, that this is the expectation or the outcome? Guess what? I'm so good at my job. They didn't say yes to one thing. They said yes to seven. So you're getting a way better outcome than you would have expected to get or that people would traditionally get in this market. And then the ask is, who do you know that's looking for that level of negotiation or that level of care or service? And that's, that's a moment, right, throughout the transaction that you can ask for referrals. And you want to continue to ask for referrals or reviews throughout the transaction. 
Most people will only ask for referrals after the transaction or they'll only ask for reviews after the transaction. There's no rule that says you can't start asking for referrals and reviews right up front. And if you ask for it up front, you're way, way, way more likely to get good ones. You're like more likely to get uh, tons of referrals. Your people are very top of mind when they're buying a house. Everyone in their life knows they're buying a house and they are thereby more likely to run into people who are thinking of buying or selling because it's in their RAS. It's part of their um, consciousness and what they're looking for and what they see more of. And then the last one is this is what will happen next. If you learn nothing else today, if the only thing you take away is that this is what will happen next, if you've never heard this before, um, humans have this gap um, of, of knowledge. So anytime you're left wondering what is going to be the next outcome, it puts it on a loop and you're gonna continue to worry about it or wonder about it. So if you've ever had a client that bugs the crap out of you and they call you every day or text you four times a day or whatever, my guess is that you're not very good at this is what will happen next. Because if you leave every conversation with that, then you buy yourself that much time until that moment. So if you say, this is what will happen next, next week, I will call you and let you know about the appraisal status or next, uh, you know, in three days, we'll schedule the home inspection or your money needs to be in escrow on Monday. Well, then guess what? You don't have to talk to them again until that moment. And so you can control the, the pace of the conversation by um, by setting up the, this is what will happen next. And by doing that, you'll have the expectation set really clearly and they'll feel much, much better about you being proactive and kind of taking control and knowing where, uh, where the conversation is going. Feel free to pop any questions you have in the text. Um, all right, survey. So who is your competition? So I'm gonna let this one sit for a minute. Um, think of who your competition is. Think of their name, like who is it? Where do they work? What company? It's probably like the answers I normally get are like Jojo, the guy who farms my neighborhood or um, oh, you know, Compass or Berkshire Hathaway or Keller Williams or um, you know, who is my competition myself? A lot of people answer, oh, I'm my, I'm my greatest competition or my schedule or my kids, right? Like they're, they're causing me to struggle. Um, but the answer that I would give you honestly is I think your competition is Amazon. I think your competition is DoorDash. I think your competition is Airbnb. Um, some people will say Zillow. I don't think it's Zillow. I think it's the on-demand experience. I think it's Netflix, right? Customers are accustomed to being able to get anything they want immediately when they want it. In fact, sometimes like in Netflix's case, in Amazon's case, in a lot of cases, they're giving you something that you didn't even know you wanted when you want it. Oh, hey, guess what? I know you want to watch, watch a new show. Here's the Queen's Gambit. Right? Nobody knew they wanted to watch a six-part series about chess in the 60s. But guess what? We all did. It's really good. And so ultimately, if you, can, if you can think of your competition as this on-demand economy that we now live in, you'll understand that your experience has to be much, 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 much greater. If your experience doesn't live up to the experience of Amazon Prime or Netflix, then you're not going to stand out. And the only way, right, Zillow can come do whatever they want and they, and they will, they will try. They definitely have the eyeballs. But um, the only way you stand a chance against an Amazon coming into the real estate experience is by building a moat around your people. So if you don't have a level 10 relationship with your people, then they're not going to be loyal to you. They're not going to work with you. They're going to choose to work with somebody who can automate it and systemize it like Amazon. Now, are there always going to be customers who prefer that? Yes. Are there always going to be people who go to Rocket Mortgage on that app on their phone? Yes, absolutely. But guess what? Most people are going to still want the care and, and the extra level of compassion and, um, and service that they receive from somebody who they feel they have a personal relationship with that they really trust. And so if you can build this moat, if you can do these things that they could never get this experience from Amazon because it's too transactional, if you can make it more relational, then you'll be able to deliver a higher customer experience. Um, if you work Zillow leads, just know that you need to pre-frame the fact that they will be receiving a survey. So when you talk to them, let them know that your goal is to provide five-star service and that they will be receiving a survey and that it would be awesome if they could give you five stars, right? Or let you know if there's any reason they couldn't. 
Um, it's the same thing with any survey you send, right? Pre-frame it, let them know that they'll be receiving it, let them know what the expectation is, but also let them know that they can be honest and that they, you know, especially if it's a survey you're sending, that you want to hear that feedback. If you run a team and you're going to be surveying, like I know Peter Shabri, right? He started doing a quality control score. Um, and if you had less than, I think a four, right? It was like out of five. If you had less than like a 4.3 in a three month or six month period or whatever it was, then you were on probation. And if it didn't raise, you were off the team. And so you can get really, really granular on this. You can get very specific about how you survey your customers to make sure that your team and your staff are providing the level of service that you would provide or providing a better level of service than, than they would get elsewhere. And that's the same thing that uh, the Four Seasons or anybody else would do, right? Any very um, customer experience driven, um, any customer experience driven uh organization is always going to have some form of surveying built in so that they can make sure that everybody on the team is doing a really good job. Um, how do you get access to the recording, Jennifer? It'll be here live in the group. So um, if you can't find it, just let me know. I'll come back and tag you in it. Um, it'll be saved live in the group. You can watch it anytime. Um, back to surveys. Um, reviews, same thing, pre-frame. So um, come up with where you want them. So some people will have um, like different reviews that they want, right? I want a Yelp review, I want a Zillow review, I want a Facebook review, I want whatever kind of review. I want a handwritten note, whatever. So you can tell them at different stages which review you want. So you can say, hey, you know, da 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 da, thanks so much, would you mind hopping on? Like restaurants will offer, like if you check into their restaurant, you get free appetizer on Yelp. So you can kind of do the same thing. You can be like, hey, if you check in, you know, we'll give you this, sweatshirt or will if you if you write us a review at this stage right then you're entered into a drawing to win x or whatever but think about where you want them to write the review do you just want to say hey go write us a review and then have it be somewhere random or do you want to have a focus for this quarter right or this this year to say hey i'm really going to beef up my facebook reviews because i'm going all in on facebook ads and so if i'm going in on facebook ads i need to have facebook reviews to match and so my whole ecosystem is going to be geared towards facebook reviews or are you trying to build out a client um, success story portion of your website? And so the only thing you care about, you're like, I don't want online reviews. I don't want digital reviews. I don't want Zillow reviews. I just want handwritten notes. So like, hey, would you take five minutes to just write me a handwritten note um, about, about your experience, right? Or send them a card. If you want to get handwritten notes back, send them a card that is like a postcard that has the, 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 the stamps already on it. Right. Make it make the return address, make everything as easy as possible and then just have them fill out the handwritten thing and mail it back. If you send that to people, they will send it back. If that's the only way you ask for reviews, that's the way you'll get reviews. And then what you can do with those is you can take a picture or you can um, scan those handwritten notes in and you can put them on like a praise page of your website or you can put them on um anywhere you want. You can upload those photos anywhere you want. And then you can direct people to those when they want to see um, testimonials and reviews about your, the, you know, the experience that customers had with you. I find that um, when real estate agents post their reviews on Facebook or anywhere on the internet, they tend to look really fake. They don't look genuine because anybody could go in and just type like, oh, John was awesome. He did such a great job, da, 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 whatever, right? Um, when it's a handwritten note, it looks a lot more genuine. It's way more um, real for everybody that's going to be checking it out. Um, framing. So same thing, survey and ask. So make sure that you frame the surveys as well. Let people know that they're coming. Um, let them know what your expectation is and let them know how they can respond if they're not having um, a good experience. Surpass. So uh, additionally, you don't just want to survey them. You, the whole point of this, the whole point of the systems, the whole point of setting the expectations, the whole point of being the expert and doing a really great job, the whole point of all of this is to get to this point where you can surpass their expectation. So a lot of high level customer experience companies like Disney or the Ritz Carlton will have 
um, surpass mechanisms built into their experience. So one really basic one is like, if you ask for directions at Disney or the Ritz Carlton, they will not just say, oh, hey, it's that way, like go down two blocks and make a left. They will actually get out and um, walk you down the road. They'll walk you down the hallway. They'll take you to the elevators. They'll walk you to the restaurant. They'll do whatever they have to do, right? And a lot of those companies also have uh, something built into their, their culture that says they cannot just pass the buck. You can't just say, oh, I don't know. Or you can just say, oh, somebody else will answer that. Like, like every single person has to have 100% ownership of the entire customer experience. So if I need a new, you know, a fresh beverage um, and I walk into the Ritz Carlton and I ask the valet, right? He's not a bartender, but I guarantee you he can go figure out who can bring me a fresh cocktail because I just walked into the Ritz Carlton. And that's a real thing, right? They really will do that. That's not just like, oh, you need to go see the bartender. He's over there. Um, those things make a big difference. Uh, additionally, things we've done are um, offer a concierge service. So um, you know how really uh, annoying it is to sit there and wait for the cable guy to show up or to try and manage the vendors um, to do a kitchen remodel or whatever those things are, right? When you have a window of time, you have to wait or you, know, you have a, a gift that you need to buy or something for the house that you need to get delivered, um, let's say, and, and Maybe you're not going to be in town, or maybe you haven't closed escrow on the property yet, or whatever. Um, having someone go and sit at the property to wait for the cable guy is an incredible service that you can add that will really add a lot of value to what you do, right? It's really white glove. You want to think about all of the pain points along the way, and you don't even have to think about them. Just keep a journal. Just keep a running list somewhere on Google Drive or whatever it is, and then create a list of all the problems that come up in your customer's daily lives as they go through the experience with you. And then every single time there's a new problem that you haven't thought of, just document it and then figure out a way to solve it in a systematic way that's going to allow you to surprise and delight your customers, right? Um, we do a moving day box. So we have a little box and it has a thing taped on the top and it says, these are some things you might've forgot about today. We were thinking of you, you know, hope you have a smooth move, the Pew Group. And in there it will be plates and cups and napkins and hand sanitizer and tape and a box cutter and all the stuff that you might've already packed away, a roll of toilet paper, whatever it is, right? Because in the middle of your move, you're always looking for something, right? One of those critical items and you don't know where to get it. You don't know what's going on. And then all of a sudden, guess what? Here's the box, the magic box. And guess what? Everything's in the box because we already thought of it because we didn't want you to have that experience. The other thing that's important about moving day stuff, right? Like dropping off a pizza along with the moving day box is that usually people get their friends to help them move. And so if you can show that you're amazing and that you think of your customers and you do a great job while they're moving and they have their friends around, then you're going to have a better experience as a result. We also offer to host housewarming parties, right? This is more non-COVID, but we do housewarming parties with all our buyers. Um, we'll bartend. We uh, we don't add everybody to our database. We you know we will do the invites, but we don't just take like fifty or a hundred people and and junk up our database with them. What we do is we we create a genuine housewarming party, right? We want to be awesome and we want them to really appreciate what we do. And then our goal is to form a relationship with two or three people. You're going to know the people that are resonating with you. You're going to know the conversations you have. You're going to know the people that you should be adding to your database and having a, a long-term relationship with rather than just the 40 or 50 people that they invited. Um, because that would be very inappropriate, right? You wouldn't want to invite a whole bunch of people to a housewarming party. And then all of a sudden they start getting your junk mail and they're on your email list and all that other crap. That is not the idea of what you're trying to do. Um, some people will deliver warm cookies at a fun part of the transaction. So once they get an accepted offer or something like that, um, there's a company called Crumble, uh, C-R-U-M-B-L. And uh, there's other ways, local bakeries, all kinds of ways you can get fresh warm cookies and milk delivered to people, which is super fun. Um, I really love an app called AvaBot right now. So Ava is like a gifting assistant. Um, she will send a survey to your clients. They'll answer a couple questions about what they like, and then she'll custom curate a box. You can have the box custom branded. You can have a handwritten note included. The entire thing gets mailed out. You get all the data back. You get to learn things like their birthday and their favorite things. And then they 
they write a little review about you. It's a really, really cool service. If anybody's interested, I can send you my link. You get a free gift. It's like 30 bucks. And then you can continue to use it if you're interested and impressed by the service. Um, they let you experience it in order to um, get you interested. So that's pretty cool as, as far as customer experiences go as well, is that Ava actually, in order to get um, referrals, they, they send you a free box, which is pretty cool. Um, Career and balloons. So this is one of my absolute very favorite ways to impress someone. Um, works much better in non-COVID times. But um, you can, uh, if you get a referral and you have something amazing arrive at their office within about an hour of that referral, you are going to blow people's mind. So have someone come in, have the courier throw on your t-shirt, right? Your polo that says, you know, the, the awesome team and have them walk in with a big thing of balloons and the cookies and whatever it is, right? Your basket, whatever referral type reward you want to give. If that shows up with a bunch of balloons at their office, well, guess what? Now, every single person in the office is like popping up their head in the cubicle. Like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Why did Joey, why did Joey just get a big thing of balloons off? They're going to go off either and like, what are they going to say? What's going on? And then what is that person going to say? That person's immediately going to be like, Oh, guess what? My realtor's awesome. I just sent him a referral and here came all this stuff. Or I just shouted him out on Facebook and here's this Starbucks gift card. Um, some people we talk to are really, really smart and good. Um, Lindsay Emerson was talking about this, how every single time someone mentions their name related to real estate, no matter what it is, whether it's on Facebook or in person or whatever, they just send them a real quick note and a, and a Starbucks gift card, like boom, boom. And you can do that because that's the leading indicator. You want to train them up front on the front end of, of this of this discussion to think of you and to say your name. But at the same time, just shouting you out on Facebook isn't necessarily going to be tied, right? That's going to be the most common action, hopefully. And so that could get really expensive if you send the, the balloons and everything. But what most people screw up is they only reward the behavior at the end when the deal closes. And most transactions never make it to closing. And so if you reward the upfront behavior of the actual referral, you'll do a lot better. Um, pets and kids. So one way that you can very easily surpass your customers' expectations is to um, reward their pets and kids or create an experience for their pets and kids. So if you were to have a client come into the office for a buyer consultation and you had a kid's coloring book that was themed about moving into a new home, or you had a little corner of the office where they had like stuff like toys and they could play with things and they had, you know, coloring and, and all that stuff, right? And maybe some snacks some kids snacks and juices, or if you went to show property and you brought some snacks or waters or whatever it is for the kids, not just the parents, um, that can go really, really far. Um, setting expectations up front, right? This, this goes back to the same thing, but like if you told a client that they need to wear comfortable shoes and that they need to, um, that this is going to be the time of the tour and would you like me to book in time to stop for a quick snack or a lunch versus just plowing through the entire day, right? Asking for questions that will allow you to curate their experience, right? Are your kids going to be joining us? If your kids are joining us, this is what we'll bring for them. This is what I would recommend or, Hey, we're going to bring a special little Little, you know, snack kit with us for the road because it's going to be a long day. What are your favorite items that we can include in the snack kit? Um, when you understand people's preferences, you can also do things to surprise and delight them at closing. So one thing that we'll do um, is to stock a client's fridge or pantry or both um, after we close escrow, but before they move in. And so if you don't know anything about your client and what they like, it's going to be harder to custom curate a fridge or a pantry full of goodies. Um, but if you have a general idea of what their favorite things are, and then those favorite things are waiting for them when they arrive, like this is the type of experience that rich people get on private jets and in all kinds of special places. And so if you can start to provide an experience that is similar to what someone is going to get by having one of these ultra VIP experiences, then this is going to give them something to talk about. It's going to give them something to share. When they hear of somebody talking about real estate, they're not just going to say, hey, you know, Jennifer is amazing at real estate. You should call her. She's a great negotiator. They can say Jennifer's amazing at real estate, but she is like the smartest, best business person I've ever met. The experience was to die for. We got custom embroidered towels. You know, she had the snacks that we wanted in the car for us. She stocked our fridge before we moved in. Like you're starting to build an experience that's worth talking about. And that's really the key here. You want to create an experience that is going to be worth talking about. 
Um, one fun hotel I heard about uh, has a popsicle phone. So they have different colors and you just pick up the color of popsicle you want. And then someone from the hotel goes running after you and brings you a purple popsicle. Um, I thought that was just super cool and different and very Instagrammable, right? You want things that will be shared. You want cool um, stories that they can tell. And then um, one of the biggest ones when I surveyed people about this was just listening to remember. So um, for instance, on a cruise with like hundreds of people, this person knew uh, the bartender knew what what drink this person liked and they knew their their name and so calling somebody by name remembering their name remembering their kids names remembering their dogs names um, one of my very favorite reviews I ever got on Yelp is actually a review that says the reason they weren't gonna hire me they butt dialed me then they had to answer so they uh, decided to meet with me anyway. And then when I came over, I spent a bunch of time talking about their dogs and what this uh, experience of selling was going to do for their dogs and where the dogs were going to go and how we were going to make this smooth for their dogs and so on and so forth. And they said the reason they hired me was because I thought about their dogs and they knew that anybody who took enough time to think about the experience their dogs was going to have was going to do an awesome job of delivering a five-star service for them. And so, you know, the only thing people love more than themselves is their dogs and their pets, or I mean, their dogs or their pets and their kids. So always go through people's pets and kids if you want to get to their heart. That's a really easy way to go through it. And then um, show how much you care solve people's problems. I do believe that you are paid in direct proportion to the problems you solve. However, you should not be reactionary about this. You should be proactive about solving their problems before they escalate or before they become problems. Um, we just had a client that closed. It was a referral from another agent. And about a week after they closed, they found out that their um, sewer line was invaded by roots and that they needed to replace the sewer line and all this stuff. Well, sure enough, during the inspection, we had called that out. We had said that there was an issue. We thought we'd have more life on it than we did. Ultimately, though, what we were able to do is we found a whole bunch of other problems. We found the home warranty wasn't ordered correctly. We found that the insurance wasn't properly put on the property through the escrow company and the lender, not our vendor, right? There's all this stuff that was outside of our span of control. But did we just say, oh, well, that's not our problem. No big deal. No, we don't just let people figure out their own problems. We jumped in. We took 100% accountability for it. We got the home warranty fixed. We found out the policy for the home warranty. We got the insurance fixed. We did everything we could every single day and over communicated with them about what we were doing to be proactive. And as a result, we were able to save them half of the bill. The bill was going to be $10,000. We got them over $5,000 because we were proactive about it and we jumped in. Do you think they would have got that $5,000 if we just said, oh, I don't know, figure it out, call the home warranty. I'm so sorry. That sucks. Hey, guess what? We told you about that during the home inspection. Like, no, that wouldn't have gone anywhere. But we jumped in and we held their hand and we created a white glove five-star experience that they will go and tell their friends about. That $5,000 savings will be the biggest thing that they remember about this process, about the entire experience of working with us. They'll remember that once we had the check in our hands, when we had no ability to make any additional money from that one transaction, that we went above and beyond to make sure that they were well taken care of. That's the type of thing that I'm talking about. That's the type of problem solving that you need to have. And if you nail it, if you take it to that level, if you do that, you will never have to worry about where your business is coming from ever again, because you will create an amazing client experience. All right, last one, sustain. So we implement a post-closing checklist that I feel is very important. On there is um, asking for reviews, asking for referrals. It's inviting them to our events. It's um, reminding them about their home uh, housewarming party. So a lot of times a client will be offered a housewarming party and they won't take you up on it. We continue to offer it over and over and over again forever. So just because somebody's lived in the house for two or three, Two or three years doesn't mean we're not still willing to do their housewarming party. Some people take a very long time to move in. You'd be surprised. Um, and people really want their house to look perfect by the time they have their housewarming party. So don't take offense if they don't take you up on it right away because most people are not um, proud of that way the house looks for quite a while. Um, referral tree. So a referral, oh, on there also on the post-closing checklist, uh, on the one week mark, we check in and see if they want us to send a handyman over. And then we do that again at the 30 day point. And a lot of times for the right clients, we'll send over um, a handyman for an hour or two and we'll pay for it. 
So we tell them, you know, during the process, hey, don't worry about this, 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 and this. We're going to send a handyman 30 days later. You just make us our, uh, your list and we pay for it and they'll take care of those things. That just eliminates a lot of friction on the ticky tacky stuff that you don't want to put in a repair request, but maybe your client paid over asking price. So how would you feel if you paid over asking price and then you weren't, um, you weren't treated that way in the middle of the process, right? You found out that like a bunch of ticky tack stuff wasn't working on your brand new car. Like that's not a great experience. You don't want to have that. And it's not a brand new car. It's a 30 year old house. But at the same time, like maybe it was a flip and it was just redone and the builders just being a jerk and like don't fix stuff. So ultimately, like we just solve those problems by allocating for a handyman to go fix those problems. And then we take care of it. We get to be the hero and it's not a big deal. Um, Referral tree. So referral tree is one of my very favorite things. I also got this from John Glutch. He's amazing. Um, he created a spreadsheet that on the left hand side has every single person that you've ever worked with or every single person you know, but essentially every single person who's ever sent you a referral. They go in the far left column. And then when they send you the referral, the name of the person they send you goes in the column to the right of that. So Susie is in the left column, column A, and she referred Bobby and Bobby goes in column B. And in column B, she also referred Timmy and Tommy and Joey, right? So Susie referred four clients. Well, then guess what? What if Joey referred like 30 clients? Well, Joey's referrals go in column C. And so now we can see that Susie was really a responsible for like 100 referrals because we can see the tree and how it branches out and it goes from one person on the far left to one to 10 to 100 to 1,000. And so by tracking that, every single time a client refers you, right, the first time they refer you something, you give them one gift or you give them one thank you or whatever. But what happens if one client refers you 100 people? You can't just give them the same thing every single time, right? That's not going to work. And so you can ultimately start to value and stack your database and your relationships and the people you go to lunch with, the people you take on vacation, the people that you give a really nice Christmas present to. Those people can start to be weighted by the depth of their referral tree, by the number of total referrals that they've generated for your business. If this is not something that you're doing, start to implement this. This right here, this one thing will change your business so much, it's unbelievable. Um, Facebook. So we had a bunch of people, if you go to my profile or if you look in the Messy Mental Mastermind group, there were some incredible people that shared. I asked a couple questions about customer experience um, in the last week or so. Go read those comments. Those comments are incredible. Um, uh, Ashley House is on here. Um, her kid was uh, sick on his birthday and Thanksgiving, and it was a really, really tough um, experience. And so what did we do? We, uh, we saw that on Facebook. We saw her post about his birthday and all the things he was into. And then we sent a care package for her son with some gifts and some things that could hopefully cheer him up and make his um, experience better. Do you think that that's something that she's going to forget? Probably not. Is that something that I wanted to do? Yes, because she's really important to me. And so I, I used Facebook as a tool to be able to get insight about what somebody's going through to be able to provide something that is very specifically related to their current experience or struggle such that they will have a memorable experience and, and really, you know, have hopefully get through that and have her kid cheered up. And, you know, nobody wants a sick kid on their birthday. Like how bad does that suck? So um, Chewy.com does a really good job of this too. So sometimes people will call and cancel their service because they'll say my pet passed away. Um, Chewy does a really good job of going being proactive and saying, keep the food, donate it to a shelter. We've taken that money off your bill and they send um, a gift um, and they send flowers and like a note that says, you know, remembering you with your pet, et cetera. Like, do you think people are ever going to not be a Chewy customer? Are they not going to recommend Chewy to all their friends and family, knowing that Chewy was the only person who sent them flowers when their dog passed away? Um, yeah, for sure. So I would, I would agree that, you know, you should do that same kind of stuff. Like you can copy, you can, there's no reason you can't send flowers when somebody's dog passes away. Like you're not Chewy and that's a little more like brand appropriate, but still like just be a thoughtful person, be a really good friend. And if you're a really good friend and a really thoughtful person, you'll get a lot more coming back with you. Um, this is a good example. This is a Santa Barbara mug. This was given to me by Justin Etherton, my buddy, my referral partner, the best agent in Santa Barbara. Well, guess what? Every single time I drink out of this and I drink out of this mug, like at least once a week, every single time I drink out of this mug, I think of Justin genius, right? Such a great gift because it's constantly reminding me of how much I love Justin. So that's a live example and that's a really good one. Um, 
client events. So make sure that you have a system for client events. If you don't have a budget, just latch onto a community event and make it like your client event. You can make it about a fundraiser. You can make it kind of anything you want. Um, gifts are a really great way to stay in touch with people. You can do pop buys. You can do things seasonally. You can do an anniversary of their home um, purchase or home sale. You can um, just do really personalized gifts like I just described by kind of watching what's going on in their life. Um, all kinds of ways that you can do small little gifts. And some people are really bad at receiving gifts. So if somebody gets offended by the gift you give them, don't take it personally. Doesn't mean they don't like you necessarily. It just means that they're uncomfortable receiving a gift. So maybe find a way to, uh, to increase the depth of that relationship or uh, maybe find a different love language that they prefer um, other than gifts because not everybody uh, has the same love language and not everybody is comfortable receiving gifts. Um, ownership. Oh, this is my favorite. Okay. So remember how I had you raise your hand and everybody said, um, one week, two weeks, two months, two years, five years, however long it's been since you talked to somebody, this works for all relationships, not just past clients, but anyone who's been sitting on your heart where you feel like, um, gosh, I'm a bad friend or why haven't I stayed in touch with them? Or gosh, I could never call them. I could never ask Tim for a referral because I just, I haven't talked to Tim in five years. And so it'd be super awkward for me to call Tim and be like, Hey Tim, who do you know? Who wants to buy or sell a house? Right? That would not work. So guess what? Call them and admit it. Call that person and say, Hey Tim, you know what? I just gotta be honest. I was thinking about you. I was driving around. I was, I was near your house. I saw your name come up in my phone. I saw you on Facebook, like whatever it is. And I just, you know, I realized it's been like five years. Like, I can't believe it's been five years since we talked. I am such a bad friend. I can't believe I haven't reached out to you. Now, guess what? Two things. Number one, the first thing Tim's going to say is, oh, hey, John, don't worry about it, man. Life gets busy. How the heck are you? Whatever. They're going to let you off the hook because you took accountability for it. They're going to let you off the hook immediately. Number two, guess what? They didn't call you either. So they're not a good friend either, right? And so it doesn't matter. It's not their, It's not anybody's job. There's no like rule book for how often your real estate agent is supposed to call you. So don't take it that way. Just reach out, take ownership, reestablish the relationship. And yeah, you might have to go from a two to a three or a three to a four or a five to a seven or a seven to a 10, whatever it is. You may have to do some extra work to build that relationship back up. But ultimately, it's worth it. And there's, I would argue there's no one that's so far removed from your relationship that you can't reestablish it if you're purposeful about it and, and if it's really important to you. If it's really important to you, you can build that relationship back up and you can get you know, whatever you want to get out of it. Um, ask and share goals. So one of the most powerful things, Ashley House just hopped on. Hey, Ashley. Um, so one of the most powerful things that um, you can do uh, to really you know, touch somebody or to ingratiate yourself into a, a power and trust position in their life is to share your goals with them. But first to ask them about their goals. How many people um, have you shared your goals with, right? And how many people have you asked them about their goals? Very frequently, people don't ask us about our goals. And therefore, um, you know, if you're the one person in their life who asked them what their goals are and you help them with those, you're going to be, you know, elevated to a really special place because maybe nobody's ever asked them that before. And maybe nobody's ever helped them do a goal planning or anything like that. Um, just one. So anytime you're asking for referrals, don't ask for all their referrals. Don't ask for a thousand referrals. Just ask for one referral. You know, I have a really big goal next year. I want to help 25 families make a move. You know, would you help me get one referral next year? You know, it would really mean a lot to me if you could help me get just one referral in the next 12 months. Um, narrowing it down to one is something that is achievable for everyone. You can get their commitment. You can get their buy-in. You can hold them accountable to it. Um, once you have their commitment and their buy-in and it's much, much more achievable. And then the bottom one is group text me because the whole point of all of this stuff, the ex exceeding expectations and creating an amazing customer experience and all that stuff is to get repeat and referral business. And so if you want to get referrals, tell them to group text you with somebody um, that they can uh, introduce you to. It's like introducing two friends at a party. It's way, 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 way more effective than just having them pass out your card or give somebody your name or anything like that. And last but not least, the reading list. 
So The Fred Factor is an incredible book, um, super easy, really fast. It's about a mailman who gave incredible service. Um, raving fans had a lot of the themes for the model that we used here today. Be Our Guest is the Disney book. How to Win Friends and Influence People is probably the oldest book on here regarding customer experience and how to um, develop amazing relationships. Purple Cow and Tribes are two books I really love from Seth Godin. Um, they're not really customer experience books, but they're people books and they're marketing books, and they help you understand how to tie these things together. Um, those are great. Uh, the Power of Moments is an incredible book that I have yet to read, but I was um, I was given some information in one of the posts that I put up, and that's where I learned about the Popsicle phone. So definitely can't wait to check out The Power of Moments. Delivering Happiness is the um, Tony Shea book about Zappos. Um, so that's going to be a really cool book right now that a lot of people are reading um, that I'll give you all about the fact that you're in the customer happiness slash service business uh, first for everybody. Um, Clients First is a good book. That's a little older. Um, Hooked on Customers, same thing. And then the Starbucks experience is a great one. Um, if you guys have gotten value out of this, I would love it if you could um, share this with a friend, tag somebody in it, add somebody amazing to Messy Middle Mastermind. Um, if you're feeling generous, you could donate to Generosity Global. You can Venmo me. Um, I will put that in the comments, or you can Venmo Sheena, or you can go on generosityglobal.org, donate there directly. Um, if you have any questions about anything we talked about today, please reach out to me and pop them in the chat here. I'll come back and check it out. Would be happy to help you with all of that. And um, yeah, I hope you got a lot of value out of this. Um, I hope it was helpful. And if you guys need anything, I'm here. Thanks again. I hope you guys have wonderful, very happy holidays.